Please join me now in welcoming Alan R. Nooner. Some familiar faces from today. I'm shocked that you're back, but okay. What we're going to talk about tonight is, is really how we relate energy efficiency or not to the impacts on health and pollution and, and all other things. So that's going to be the topic of discussion. We'll start with, you know, energy is, touches every part of our lives, okay? So as we increase the use of energy, if you saw the slides that were playing while you came in, it shows from 1850 a rapid increase in energy use. So that's got a negative impact on air quality and health, right? So it also has, you know, we hear a lot about climate change, CO2 uh, emissions, um, global warming. You know, it's also got an impact on that, which is climate induced, human induced climate change. So energy reduction is one of the few things we can do that I didn't do it. Okay. We're back. Uh, that can positively impact not only costs, you know, what it costs us to live, improves the quality of the air we breathe, because if we use less energy, there's less coal burned in a power plant, correct? But also we're going to demonstrate and quantify for you uh, what the impact on that is in health, as uh, shown in less respiratory um, distress injuries, less asthma, uh, less deaths, all right, and what that's worth in dollars to, to the healthcare industry. So over time, you know, humanity has, has relied on energy to do many things. I mean, starting with Paleolithic people, you know, fire was their first source of warmth. I mean, rather, other than bury themselves under branches with fire, they could now stay warm and, and have more control over their environment. So every step of evolution, all right, brought with it an increase in energy usage, whether it was for tool making, weapon making, you know, and the big spike came in 1850, in the early 1850s with the Industrial Revolution, when all of a sudden, we were no longer an economy that just used wood but one that used coal and now had transportation of trains and steamboats and then soon automobiles. And so, you know, this brought in a dramatic increase in energy consumption across the country. <clears throat> the second industrial revolution was actually with when electricity was able to be transmitted. You know, because up until that point in the early 1900s, Everything was localized. I mean, either out a water mill or a steam turbine or, or not a steam turbine, a steam engine to generate power, but you couldn't transmit that power across the whole country. With the electrification, you know, being able to, to run a wire and get power to everyone came another type of revolution in this country. Uh, 1963 was the first Clean Air Impact, Clean Air Act. That really came about because in 1948, uh, there were 20 people killed in Denora, Pennsylvania due to air pollution. I mean, that was kind of news to me. Uh, in 52, 4,000 people died in London. You know, when they had a temperature inversion, it trapped all the pollutants at, at uh, ground level. I will tell you that as recently as I think the last time I was in England was about 1986. And at that time, you could see a steel mill from over 50 miles away because they had, even in 1986, no pollution control, okay? Because their theory was we're an island. It's all gonna blow away, it doesn't affect us, all right? It's different today, but back even in the 80s, uh, they had no, no pollution controls whatsoever. And then of course, acid rain, we've all heard about. You know, it, it, it wrecks our lakes, our streams, uh, wildlife, um, all kinds of things. So those are the things, you know, the downsides of, of using energy. And this is actually what it probably looked like. Um, this is actually a steel mill from probably the late 1800s. Um, you know, I'm from Danville. Danville had five iron mills in it. I would guess you wouldn't have been able to see from town any of the mountains surrounding Danville. You know, that whole town would have just been smogged in with, with heavy smoke from the iron making industry, okay? 
So we talked about how in the eight, with the Industrial Revolution, energy use changed. Now this graph is showing that up until this point, pretty much it was a wood economy for energy, all right? People use wood for heating, wood for, you know, even the, the early trains, right? They used wood for the boilers. <clears throat> but once, you know, coal was discovered and put to use and steel mills and all those things, coal became the dominant fuel, okay? And it stayed that way up into the early 1900s, you know, at which point we started burning some petroleum and some natural gas, okay? And you can see hydroelectric's really been pretty stable, you know, for the last 100 years, okay? So what does this look like for Pennsylvania? Uh, this slide is kind of interesting because these top 20 toxic, the toxic 20 as they call it, produce 92% of the air pollution in this country, okay? And Pennsylvania, of course, is number three. You know, we're number three, all right? So these are states that use a lot of coal-fired generation. They're states that have coal. I mean, I was a little bit surprised that Texas uh, was way down here somewhere, but then as I thought about it, Texas has oil, natural gas, and so most of their power is, is uh, created using that. But what this says is that a relatively small population, quite frankly, these four states, if you can have an impact there, you can really substantially impact air quality and health throughout the country, okay? This is a look forward, uh, what the fuels are, and what's surprising about this is, you know, we all hear about renewables and solar panels and windmills, but quite frankly, from today at 13% up through 2040, that's really not forecast to change that greatly, okay? You'll see there's a steady increase in energy usage, all right? Nuclear stays pretty much the same. Coal doesn't decline nearly as, as much as I thought it would. I, I, you know, in my mind, because you hear the Obama administration constantly talking about uh, tying up carbon you know, to re reduce CO2 pollution. Um, reflect, not reflected in this, uh, which surprised me. So energy is gonna continue to be a bigger part of our lives. I, I guess that's really the bottom line in all this. Anybody ever heard of the triple bottom line? No, okay. Triple bottom line is a sustainability concept in that values people, planet, profit, okay? Um, and that's really a nickname for the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. And I, <clears throat> what it means is that we wanna find a way to be a truly sustainable organization or a society that we can benefit all three. And energy, as I said in the, in the beginning, is one of the few things that can do that. Because as we reduce energy, we save money, so that's the profit part. We create less pollution, that's the planet part, and we improve the health of people. So this is the concept we wanna apply as we move forward in, in things we do with energy. Now, as we talk about sustainable energy, we also need to look at the cost to buy and operate that. Uh, and this slide depicts that. So you hear the hydrogen economy, fuel cells, okay? There's the top line here. Fuel cells are fine. They don't create any pollution other than water, you know, which really isn't pollution. But look at the cost to do that, okay? It's the most expensive uh, proposition up there. Uh, the blue is the capital cost, gray is, uh, is variable operating and maintenance costs, and then yellow is the fuel cost for the hydrogen. Uh, next on the list would be biomass, okay? Solar uh, photovoltaics are coming down in price. Obviously, the beauty of that is you have capital costs and you have some operating and maintenance, but there's no fuel, right? Sun's free. Uh, wind, same story. Uh, combustion turbine, if you've heard of cogeneration, it's a process that they put in at Williamsport Hospital. Uh, we have one in Danville, that's five megawatts. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in depth a few slides from now. And then the last is a concept we wanna to discuss tonight is the megawatt, 
okay? And what a megawatt is, is a watt that's saved through improving efficiency, okay? So in other words, if I, for an easy, easy uh, project, change out a light bulb from 100 watts to 50 watts, I've created 50 megawatts. I've reduced my usage by 50 watts, okay? That is absolutely the most cost efficient energy conservation technique you can employ, all right? And we're gonna talk about some of those projects in a few. All right, so this is the concept of the megawatt. It was actually, um, first term, the term was used by Amory Lovins out at the Mountain Institute. <clears throat> and it's this whole concept of conservation. And what we're gonna to do tonight is what that is worth, okay? So we're gonna go through some examples as we go on to see if we have a, a certain energy level reduction in each household. What does that mean nationally? All right, what does that look like? <coughs> I'm pretty sure when President Obama said this, he was talking about our energy program at Geisinger, but maybe not. Maybe it was about healthcare, but you know, bottom line, even the energy impacts healthcare, but you know, we're very honored that uh, G President Obama has recognized Geisinger as being a leader and an innovator, you know, and that's really what our energy program is. We're, we're innovators in how we approach things. So if we talk about healthcare, you know, the mission of healthcare is not to cure cancer or treat disease, it's, it's really to improve the health of the communities we serve, all right? So we can do that in a number of ways. We can do that by providing health care, but we can also do that by uh, how we improve the environment in which you live. So what we're doing with energy is really mission-centric, if you will, uh, to the Geisinger Healthcare mission. So the premise is, is that we reduce energy, reduce pollution, reduce pollution, reduces, improves health, all right? So what we've been able to do is bend the curve. You saw in the graphs that energy use in the United States was going up, right? Geisinger has expanded significantly, but yet our energy use has gone down, all right? And our costs have gone down, and we're gonna show you that. Uh, the, you know, that's resulted in us scoring a, a 100 on EPA's Energy Star. Uh, what that means is, you know, like when you take standardized testing, you score in a certain percentile, we're in the hundredth percentile. So there's no one better than us in the country, okay? Didn't know that, did you? It's not something that makes the paper as much, but. Um, and then operationally, this has saved us about $10 million a year in energy expense, okay? Now, some of the classes I talked to today, you know, Geisinger operates at a profit of about 3% a year. All right, everybody probably would have thought it was much more, but it's only 3%. So, <clears throat> $10 million in savings would have taken Geisinger $330 million in revenue to make 10 million. Okay, so you get the math? 3% of 330 is 10, okay? So that's the impact, and it's really fun when you get in an argument with a surgeon who says, well, I bring in $10 million worth of revenue. I can stand there and say, well, that's great, I bring in $330 million. Yeah, so, um, but it's a significant impact to a healthcare system. It's a significant impact to a university. It's a significant impact to, en to any industry to really get a hold of your energy costs and drive them down. So, this is what we've accomplished. You know, when I started there in 1988, before most of you were born, um, this campus was 1.2 million square feet. Today it's 3 million square feet in Danville. <clears throat> we've expanded 250%. Our utility expenses today are the same as they were in 1988, even though the building is 250% larger, okay? our electrical demand is actually lower than it was in 1988. And for that, you know, we've won some awards, which Rick went through. So this is what it looks like graphically. Uh, the blue line on top is the square footage of the campus, so that's as the campus grew. You'll see the line goes up, okay? 
This is our electrical demand. Right here, I installed a 69,000 volt substation. I put in a 10 megawatt substation and I was really scared because the first year we were at eight megawatts. So I took it upon myself, you know, I thought they're gonna fire me. You know, I built a thing too small. Two years from now, we're gonna have to do it again. So we really took it upon ourselves to reduce our demand, okay, by, through energy efficiency. And you'll see some significant points in this graph. Right here is a lighting project. We dropped the electrical load one megawatt, which, you know, based on an eight megawatt load is 12 and a half percent, okay? our very first lighting project. This substantial decrease was cogeneration installed in 2012. Um, you know, we generate approximately 36 million kilowatt hours a year uh, at a savings of about two and a half million bucks annually. So that was that significant decrease. Now what's really interesting is if I take this number, actually this number, divided by this number, you get that. So that's watts per square foot. So now we've unitized, right, our usage to be able to look at what we've done per square foot, all right? So we've gone from 600 and, oops, wrong button, about 630 watts per square foot down to about 150. Okay. Now when we, go into places and we want to decrease energy. You know, I, I know a lot of you take control classes and different things. This slide is pretty much from my experience, okay? And we do this a lot because as we acquire other hospitals, you know, we started out as one hospital, we're now 10. Um, you know, one of the first things we go in, do when we go in is to save them energy to make them some quick money, all right? To improve their profitability. Now what I find is that we can impact their costs about 10% by just doing adjustments. Whether that's condensing temperature on a cooling tower, whether that's chilled water temperature, whether that's lowering thermostats, okay? That can have about a 10% decrease on your cost. The next 10% we normally get is through how we buy. You know, since I'm buying for somewhere around 500 uh, accounts, utility accounts, we get pretty decent pricing. So I can save somebody about 10% through our purchasing. But really, the, the bulk of it, you know, the biggest piece of this pie is through efficiency, okay? Whether that's uh, replacing boiler burners, boiler controls, new chillers, uh, that's where the meat is. It's in these conversion processes. So what's the conversion process? A conversion process is where I, I, I have energy of one type and I want it as another. So lighting is really a conversion process, right? I don't use electricity to see, I use light. So I take electricity, I convert it to light. Same as natural gas is a chemical conversion to heat you know, for, in a boiler, all right? So I don't want the natural gas, I want the heat. Um, same in a chiller. So that's really where the bread and butter of these efficiencies lie. Okay, and that, and that basic equipment. So some of the things we've done, uh, lighting of course, uh, advanced chillers, variable air volume, all those things, reset schedules. <coughs> we'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of our systems. Uh, this is a photovoltaic system. As you saw in a previous slide, photovoltaic is not really one of the more cost-effective technologies, however, uh, we felt it important that, and this is on the roof of Children's Hospital in Danville, to make that association of children, our future, clean air, clean energy. Um, so we've installed a 38 kW solar panel array there. We're gonna be doing some more, uh, probably do one in Wilkes-Barre. Uh, it's, not, it's not the best investment, but it's, it's an investment that always pays a return, okay? There's no maintenance, there's no fuel, there's, you know, there's, it's, it's relatively simple. The other beauty of solar for a healthcare system is we've got lots of roofs, right? So we've got the space to do it. And also our electrical peak is generally coincident with the highest generation of the panels. <clears throat> so what it does do for us is that it helps our demand rate 
So if you understand anything about electrical uh, rate structures, you pay more, the higher your, the de your demand usage on a hot day, the more you pay. So this helps curtail that demand, all right? So it, it really helps us get a, a better electrical rate. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is our chiller plant, so a lot of the work has been done here. It's rather unique in that uh, we've talked, we have chilled water storage, and some of the classes I talked to, to today, we talked about that, but that's what a thermal storage tank looks like. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that. Uh, we've got, and that tank is 8,000 ton hours, so it's a million gallon tank with a 12 degree delta T, <clears throat> which equates to 8,000 ton hours of cooling and storage, okay? So how does a chilled water storage tank work? Uh, typically, this is what a cooling load would look like for a site, okay? In the part of the day, is your highest cooling load. At night, not so much, right? So what we do with a, a chilled water storage tank is that we shift this load to here, all right? So what does that mean? means I only need half the tonnage capacity, okay? So let's say, you know, the example we used today in some classes was, a th let's say this is 1,000 tons, and if I do this, my peak load is now only 500 tons from the chillers because I'm gonna put it in storage and then pull the other 500 tons out of storage, all right? So I have to buy less equipment, uh, less, stuff to run, less stuff to maintain it. The tank doesn't require any maintenance per se. There's, you know, there's nothing to do to it. <clears throat> so by doing that, we do a number of things. We switch our electrical use to off peak and electricity at night is one third cheaper than it is during the day. So automatically we lower our cooling costs by a third, 30%, okay? Secondly, at night, the approach temperatures on the chillers Anytime you have any air conditioning equipment, its efficiency is dictated by the temperature you reject heat to. So the cooler it is outside, the more efficient your air conditioner is. Well, it's cooler at night, right? So we're able to not only have cheaper electricity, but a more efficient machine, okay? So we're really literally able to, provide, to create cooling for the campus at about half the cost here as it costs us during the day. So if we're shifting this entire load to here and here, we cut that cost by 50%, okay? Just a different way to do some stuff. <clears throat> this is a big topic. We're gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, um, and that is cogeneration. Typical utility power plants, PP&L, it doesn't matter who it is, run at an efficiency of 31%. Okay. From here on a good day, you can probably see Berwick Power Plant, the plume coming up. You can probably see Washingtonville, all right? The reason you can see that is at 31% efficiency, they're throwing away 69% of the energy that went in, okay? They have no need for the heat, all right? They're, they're in the business of selling electricity. What we really need to ask is why don't we build power plants in cities and heat the city for free? All right, that's, that's really a social thing we need to talk about. But for right now, it's thrown away, okay? So let's say this is Penn College. That's the load, okay? And Penn College on a, on a given day needs 30 units of electricity and 45 units of steam, okay? Steam for heating and electricity for lights and whatever else, fans. So to make 30 units of electricity at 31% efficiency, working backwards, takes 98 units of fuel. And that's just merely 30 divided by 0.31, okay? 45 units of steam, boilers operate at about 80% efficiency. So that requires 56 units of fuel. So we've got a, an efficiency of a load of 75 divided by 154 of 49%. Okay, do you understand the math? So in cogeneration, what that is, is that we, you know, for a site like a college or a hospital where you constantly have a need for heat, 
you know, because of dormitories, showers, hot water, cooking. If you create your own electricity, you can use that heat. You're not going to throw it away like the utility, all right? So that's what we do. So here we take that same 100, you know, 100 units of fuel in, we're serving the same load, but we now have a 75% efficiency because we're not throwing any of this away while making this, all right? So, I mean, if you think about this, this is 50% more efficient than that. Since we buy fuel at the same price, I mean, price of natural gas is a price of natural gas, right? So if the pp is buying it, same price to me. If I can get a much higher efficiency, I have a much lower cost, all right? And that's how a cogeneration unit like ours saved us 2.5 million a year. So this is what it looks like in, in our loads. Uh, our, our cogeneration unit produces about 80% of our steam annually and about 40% of our electricity. We wish it was more here in electricity because electricity is more expensive than gas. However, <clears throat> if we didn't use it all, we'd be no better than the utility. Okay, so you size these things based on your heat load, on what your steam load is in the summer, in essence. Uh, because otherwise, you'd be venting exhaust and throwing it away like the utility does. So what we've done, uh, and this is what the project looked like, we started out with a project that was 5.3 million. Uh, we were very fortunate to get an ARA grant from the federal government for two and a quarter million. Uh, a grant from 500,000 from PP&L. Um, the project cost of about that. Uh, our first year of operation, we saw our cost decrease $2.2 million for a payback of 14 months. This has since increased. And the reason it's increased because we were venting some exhaust, so we installed a steam turbine chiller to use that heat. Uh, and by doing that, we got an additional 1,500 ton, tons of air conditioning for free. Okay, because it was waste heat at that point, and uh, we're able to make air conditioning out of that with steam turbine chiller. Okay, so now we're up to about 2.5 million a year savings. We look a lot across all our hospitals, and, and we do this kind of graph for every one of them. Um, you know, once you get out of school, really, you know, people don't, you know, other than us, don't really care about. BTUs and kilowatt hours and other things. I mean, it really boils down to dollars, right? <clears throat> so we tend to measure our performance in dollars. So this is what the cost per square foot in Danville looks like, okay, from 2008 to 2015. So we're now at $1.57. To put that in perspective, um, that's about the cost, it, uh, it costs to operate a house per square foot. I mean, if you've got a 2,000 square foot house, that would translate to about $250 a month in utility bills, okay? So to think of a hospital with all its numerous utilities, 24 seven operation, fully occupied, uh, pretty amazing. This on the left is, uh, in 2013, we acquired uh, Community Medical Center in Scranton. And typical of most hospitals we acquire they were up at $5.20 a square foot uh, for their utility costs. And in two years now, we've brought them down. This number is actually $2.82, all right? So for them, it's a savings of about a million and a half annually, for a small hospital, which is a significant number for them, okay? And of course, a lot of that work was replacing chillers, boilers, cooling towers, lighting, all the, all the bread and butter stuff. Uh, again, this is Danville. The reason I show this slide is the, the difference uh, with cogeneration from purchase electricity price to purchase gas. So you can see prior to cogeneration, you know, most of our expenditure was for electricity, and now it's just the opposite it's for gas. All right, but the costs continue to decline. So let's talk a little bit about power plants. We talked about their efficiency, and you know this is a local power plant you know, in Washingtonville. 
And this is the impact on pollution that that coal plant provides. And, and I gotta tell you, that's one of the cleanest coal plants in the country, okay? So other coal plants aren't this good, all right? But you'll see a tremendous impact on carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, NOx, and mercury. Um, the next slide is very telling. This is a study done of coal plants, and specifically that coal plant. But what this slide says is that coal plants nationwide cause over 13,000 deaths annually. And this is because the fineness of the particle that gets through actually passes through your lungs into your bloodstream and then damages internal organs, okay? So specifically to that power plant in Washingtonville, these are the impacts. So that with, if that power plant weren't there, we should see 34 less deaths per year around the region. Right? Pretty significant number, especially if you're one of the 34, all right? Be pretty significant to you. Heart attacks, 59 less. And then they put a valuation on that. Now I'm not sure what data they use for their valuation. The slides I'm gonna show you that we've created, we actually use EPA databases on, all right, to come up with these. So, you know, by having cleaner air, these are the impacts you would expect, less asthma, less hospital admissions, all those things. But I mean, I, quite frankly, I was blown away by that number. All right, I never anticipated it would be that high. What's going on in the area? Fracking, okay, natural gas. Natural gas is a good thing, in my view. Um, fracking, eh, not so much, all right, but, you know, we talked at lunch today. I mean, when you compare other energy sources, I mean, if any of you have been to Shimokin or anywhere down in the coal regions and see the blight caused by coal mining to our mountains, fracking doesn't look so bad, okay? But look what it does for us environmentally. It generates only half the CO2. Why? What's natural gas? Natural gas is methane, CH4. It's four parts hydrogen to one part carbon. All right, coal is all carbon. All right, so that's why it creates much less CO2. Carbon monoxide, way less. Nitrogen oxides, way less. Sulfur dioxide, virtually non-existent. I mean, there's a lot of sulfur in coal, there's not sulfur in natural gas. Same with particulates, you know, coal obviously emits particulates. And then mercury, zip. Okay, there's always mercury in coal, in case you didn't know that. So that's when you burn coal, you release mercury into the atmosphere, which is a carcinogen. So natural gas is a good replacement to get us through to the point where renewables can take over. Okay, so as the renewable market climbs, you know, hopefully we'll, be, we'll not be using coal and be uh, sustaining on natural gas. So in an energy, in a uh, health pyramid, you know, a coal plant or any pollution at the bottom of the pyramid is functions that you, you know, affect a lot of people, like me with my cough can possibly be from air pollution, okay? It's not serious, it's not debilitating, it's at the bottom of the thing. I mean, it's, it's bothersome, but no more than that. Next step up, of course, is once we have some real symptoms, asthma attacks, things like that, then up here we get into medical treatment, school, you know, missing work, missing school. Next level up, again, fewer people affected, but more serious where they have to go to the emergency room. And then last but not least, the 34 people who die because of the plants here, okay? <clears throat> so what we've done on this chart is to look at the $10 million we saved at Geisinger, what our energy use was, what it is now, what we've saved, and what our specific impacts just from the Geisinger health system and our, and our energy efficiency um, efforts have created. Okay, so that's what this is. The numbers on this chart, if you remember when we were at 630 BTU, or uh, I'm sorry, watts per square foot, a couple of slides back, that is this number converted to kilowatt hours based on our current square footage. So remember that the 630 was at a million two square feet. 
So the supposition here is if, if we hadn't done anything to improve our energy efficiency, where would we be today, all right? So that's this column. Everybody understand that? So this is where we actually are. This is our actual purchased electricity. This is our cost of electricity. This is, you know, again, the pollution that would be uh, emitted at the power plant to, to, to create that electricity and the health impacts for both scenarios. The savings is column A minus column B, all right? So this is how we've benefited from our energy efficiency efforts, all right? We've saved between nine and $10 million. We've reduced our CO2 footprint by 62,000 tons, okay? Not an insignificant number. Mercury by 5.23 tons. And then supposedly per million population, we should have averted 1.4 deaths. I always wonder about the 0.4. Um, you know, this many less cases of bronchitis. So these are the impacts. Since we are also a health insurer, we should be enjoying these savings in our health plan, right, through the Geisinger Health Plan, because those are direct medical costs associated with these illness reductions, okay? And this, again, is straight from the EPA database. You know, when you, when you hear on the news that they're gonna promulgate some new regulation that's gonna save a gazillion dollars, right there. All right, so this is the same thing, just different numbers crunched through, okay? <clears throat> if we look at this for the territory we serve, which is, you know, central Pennsylvania, we have a population of 2.6 million. So essentially, we take the stuff that was in the column on the right, we multiply it by 2.6, and instead of having 1.4 deaths, we now have 3.64 for our service territory, all right? So that the communities we serve, this is our, our total impact, all right, with our energy efficiency efforts. Uh, you know, for that, we got the Energy Star. We've talked about that. So the next piece is, you know, what can we all do? I mean, you're all here, right? And it seems all the things we do can be rather insignificant compared to when you look at a power plant or when you look at what Geisinger can accomplish. But what we're going to go through here is, a lot of little impacts rolled up across the country is a huge, significant number, okay? And maybe a couple of years ago, you remember the government um, putting out a, you know, it was kind of like a news or urging people to unplug their cell phone chargers, okay? And you think, really? I mean, that's a quarter of a watt, maybe? <laughs> Take a quarter of a watt if I had a guess, there's probably about 600 million cell phones in the country. We all have how many chargers, right? Is there anybody here of just one? No, I kind of doubt that. But you start running the numbers, we're gonna see something very similar here. It, it becomes a huge, huge number if we all act. So what's the premise here? Premise is we're gonna take a 100 watt light bulb in your house, we're gonna change it out to a five watts LED, and we're gonna see what that comes up to. So it gives me a 95 watt savings. Uh, we're gonna assume six hour per day use, you know, pretty, pretty conservative, five, five o'clock at night till 11. Um, so per day it's 0.57 kW, again, not much power. Uh, 208 kilowatt hours a year. Now, where it comes into here is that there's 123 million households in the country, okay? So we're gonna multiply that times 123 million, which gives us 25 billion 625,000 kilowatt hours, all right? So that would be the equivalent of shutting down two and a, two and a quarter power plants uh, throughout the country at an average power price of 10 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, we'd have a national savings of $2.5 million and every household would save about 20 bucks, okay? One simple thing, you know, instead of building power plants, we can start shutting some off, right? Wouldn't that be great? 
So it, it, it brings to light, you know, the magnitude of what, if we all act, what that can do to society. Now, from, uh, I promised you we'd look at what this really looks like when I run it through the computer. And this is something you can all do. I mean, as a university, personally, uh, there's a, a website called Energy Impact Calculator. Um, you can find it either on a Practice Green Health website or just do a web search on Energy Impact Calculator. And it'll allow you to put in electric use. And what I've done here is the 25 billion kilowatt hours we just talked about, plug that in and to see what impact that would have. Well, that would reduce CO2 by 13, almost 14 million tons. I mean, I can't even comprehend how big that number is in tons, all right? <clears throat> tons of SO2, 100,000. Mercury, 1,100 tons. Uh, look at the healthcare impact, 31 deaths prevented, okay? Direct medical cost savings. Uh, where are they here? Direct medical costs, $290 million across the country. We changed a light bulb. Okay. Pretty amazing. So, what if we got really crazy? You know, we just showed you how Geisinger has saved about 40% of all their energy usage. Is it too much to assume that we could all save 10? You know, not just in our residences, but in our factories and our schools and, and other things. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that's very reasonable. I think it's very easily achieved. So what does that look like? Now we've got this number of kilowatt hours. Let's see, uh, millions, billions. Trillions. Oh, no, that's annual, annual generation, so we take 10% of that, all right. So we're at 406 billion kilowatt hours of generation that we would save, okay. In dollars, that would be $40 trillion that we'd all save, have in our pockets. Pretty much works out the national debt, right? We'd be able to close 36 power plants across the country. That's almost one per state. Okay, and that's assuming a power plant of about 1,300 megawatts. You know, we're not talking little natural gas plants here. We're talking big nuclear plants. Okay. Again, we take a look at those numbers, run it, run it through the energy calculator, energy impact calculator. We're now at, for direct medical costs, 4.6 billion. Okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to even uh, understand these numbers, but I, I mean, it, it's just such a huge impact if we can spread the gospel, right? You know, that's what it's about. We all need to do some of this. A um, little bit more about Geisinger. We have, uh, we have the most lead buildings in the state. Um, in healthcare sector, we, you know, 39% of all the healthcare buildings that we have are lead. Um, of course, there's a lot, of, a lot written about that. We kind of embrace LEED because most of the points within LEED are energy points. Um, so it kind of makes people do the right thing, okay? Another aspect that we've put in place is to really get, you know, to make this work, and, and the facilities guys in the rooms can appreciate this, it's not always easy to get money to do the right things. Okay, so we've established a green fund where actually employees can contribute to, vendors can contribute to. Uh, I started about two years ago. We've already got about $400,000 in it uh, and, and funded part of that solar project you saw at Children's. So that's not money we have to go get from the organization. We, we have people who donate to do that. Uh, and we talk about the solar project there. So this is what that green fund looks like at the, at the moment, or our, our funding has been over the last four years. Um, you know, we talked about this Energy Works grant. We do a lot with the Act 129 grants from the utilities where they incent you to become more efficient because they've made an obligation to the government to generate less electricity, to sell less. So the only way they can do that is to pay you to reduce your load, you know, to install more efficient equipment, better lighting, whatever it may be. Um, 
We've got some RCAP grants, and don't even ask me. I mean, that's just politicians walking around handing out money. You know, we happen to get 600,000 uh, bucks. You know, they like, to, they like to, to give you the big check on TV, but then try to collect. Yeah, it's, it's these guys are laughing because they're a part of it. <laughs> um, solar energy grants. And then here's our green fund. At, uh, when I made this slide, it was 350,000. I just got a donation the other day from a, a local vendor for, for $40,000. So that's up around um, 400,000 now. So what do we do? What are, you know, where do we go from here? I mean, for us, it's taking all the things we've learned in Danville and applying them across all our hospitals, all right? So that significantly reduces our energy footprint. We showed you how on hospitals we acquire, we go in and we lower their energy consumption, all right? We make money at doing that, we increase their profitability, we improve the health of the region, and quite frankly, as a facilities guy, it really makes us look good, okay? I mean. There's nothing uh, breeds, you know, uh, breeds money coming at you than better than success. <clears throat> We're going to continue with lead design because we think that's, you know, whether it's lead or whether it's some other accrediting agency for energy efficient buildings, it doesn't matter, but that keeps in a, us in a true direction. Because whenever you build a building, someone's going to say, well, geez, you know, if I put in a cheaper HVAC system, I can save 100,000 bucks. Well, yeah, you could. Unfortunately, you're gonna pay for that over the next 40 years of building life. You know, one of the, the things we talked about in some of the classes today, if you look at the 40 year life cycle cost of a building, construction costs are only 11% of that 40 year cost, all right? Operating costs, the energy it consumes is 50%. So when you're you're making decisions up front in construction to reduce costs and increase energy use, it's the tail wagging the dog, right? I mean, you're making the wrong decision because you're gonna pay for it five times more in the coming years, all right? So that keeps us honest, that keeps the organization honest and doing the right things. And, you know, we, I, I go around, I speak around the country probably 10, 12 times a year, we publish articles because we want people to learn, you know, we're, we're we want people to be disciples. You know, we, we, we really want people to, to do this because it, it benefits all of us, it benefits our children, right? So, what have we talked about today? That energy is critical to our future. You know, there's no doubt, doubt about that. It's great to have a, a national resource in natural gas. That additional energy uh, use causes pollution. I mean, until we're totally into a sustainable uh, energy environment, anytime we burn something or use nuclear fuel, I mean, there's, there's, it's going to create pollution. Pollution negatively impacts health. Megawatts reduce pollution and improve health, right? And then lastly, that individual improvements across a wide range have tremendous impact, all right? So that's what we're really here to do. Okay, with that, I think I'm right on time. Although you said I, there was no way I could do 50 slides in 50 minutes, I think we're right there. Uh, so we're gonna open up for some questions and Rick's gonna help moderate that. Yep. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, we'd like to give him a hand at this point. <laughs> We obviously have here a real resource who has uh, demonstrated results. So uh, we have opportunity for you to ask questions. So we'd like you to raise your hand because we have some microphones that we can put there and then everyone can hear your question, everybody can be a part of it. So who would like to uh, ask the first question? Let's make a little noise because I might miss you. <laughs> You put your hand up quietly. There okay, you go. somebody's pointing. Right, right here. There. Right there. Yeah, so, uh, as, yeah, as students and house owner, homeowners, mm -hmm. uh, where do we start again? Where, where, what's, what's 
which well, I, I mean, do tonight the, the, when I go back home. Yeah, I mean, the best place to start is always lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy. I mean, you, you twist something out and you twist something back in. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, lighting paybacks are three to four years. So on your money, that's 25 to 30% return. I think probably on your checking account, you're making less than 1% now. So uh, economically, it makes sense. Um, from there, I mean, obviously, all the things in a house, I mean, insulation, air leakage, uh, more efficient boiler, water heater. I mean, there's so many things. Does it really pay to pull out the, the, the chargers from the wall? Well, for you and I, we'd never notice in our electric bill, okay? But add it up nationally and start applying the numbers the way we did here for number of chargers in the country, and it's, it's serious usage. So on a national basis, yes, there's there reason to do that. But if you saved, I think I figured it out on my electric bill, it would be like a dime. <laughs> All right, but again, a dime across 123 million households times how many chargers per household, you know, pretty soon you're talking real money. Yeah. So it does make a difference. Oh, yeah, yep, sure does. And I was astounded when I ran these numbers because I've never done this before. So here you go. <laughs> That's what you're going to be doing tonight, okay? You pull out your, <coughs> the, the chargers from the yes. wall, okay? Yep. <laughs> A question over here? Uh, the, the Pennsylvania uh, DEP has a listening session here tomorrow night mm -hmm. on the uh, EPA uh, clean power plan. Yep. Uh, at 6 o'clock in the Mountain Laurel Room. If you could reduce your presentation to five minutes, it'd be quite valuable. <laughs> and I, I trust you will have some input in, into the Pennsylvania's yes. uh, plan. Uh, they accept yep. comments until November 12th. Okay. My question is, uh, you said that uh, by reducing the, uh, your, your, your utility costs, you, you've been able to increase your profits. Can you also de well, de decrease? Well, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. It, it, it increases profitability, but what, what we do is we actually reinvest that. So with the money we've saved, I actually got a $10 million allocation annually to do more. Okay, so we reinvest could, that into more projects. If you could reduce the cost of health care. Yeah, I don't think we're going to reduce the cost of health care just through energy. Uh, Geisinger is about a $4 billion corporation. Our total utility bill uh, is somewhere around $15 million, so that's way less than 1% of our total cost. So even though it's a significant number, in this, you know, against the size of the whole corporation, it really doesn't do a whole lot. You understand? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I, when I came from industry, you know, I worked at U.S. Steel, energy was 50% of our cost, okay? So in a ton of steel, you know, let's say it's a ton of steel goes for 500 bucks now maybe, energy was 250 bucks. When I worked for Airco BOC, energy was 95% of the product cost. All right, so whatever a gallon of liquid oxygen or liquid nitrogen sold for, 95% of that cost was energy because the raw material was free, right? It's air. Um, so in healthcare, that energy cost is extremely low. Our highest costs are, are um, employees. You know, our wages are about 65% of our total cost. And then second after that would be pharmaceuticals. So energy is way down there on that list and impacting the cost of healthcare. But it helps. It doesn't hurt. Other questions? Um, one of the things you mentioned is that um, over the 40 year span of a building, that 11% mm -hmm. is the construction and 50% is the energy usage. I was curious, where's the remainder of that go? The, the remainder of the. The other. Per, uh, the other so like, we've got 61% roughly between right, construction. And, right. The rest is, is um, financing costs on the capital invested so also and renovations. Oh, okay. Renovations over that 40 year period, you know, because chances are, especially in a commercial building, it's going to probably be renovated every five to 10 years to some okay. extent, moving offices, whatever. Okay. So, yeah, those costs are, you know, somewhere around 20% 20, 20 each. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Yes. Mm 
-hmm. <coughs> natural gas. We, uh, we burn natural gas in a combustion turbine, which is, I'm sorry, if you couldn't hear the question, what fuel source do we use for our cogeneration? <coughs> we burn it in a combustion turbine, which is essentially a jet engine. Okay, so it's a radial engine, and quite frankly, uh, it's about that long and about yay big around, and it's 6,700 horsepower, you know, in that small footprint. Um, the entire cogeneration unit is about, is not quite the size of a tractor trailer, you know, the trailer piece itself. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yep, or, yeah. Yep, that's, that's the definition of cogeneration, right. You're cogenerating heat and power as you need it. Actually, you know, you could say in summer as we, we're tri-generation tri because we're making air conditioning, heat, and electricity in the same process, okay? Yeah. So, so let's say you need to uh, provide more heat. Mm -hmm. Can you sell energy back to the grid? You can, do if you, you have a unit that size to do that. We're, you know, we, uh, we can never do that. Our demand on the campus is always greater what, than what our electrical generation capacity is, okay? <clears throat> now, I mean, Reading Hospital, is, as a, for instance, has two cogeneration units the same as size I do. It's a smaller hospital. They generate to the grid. They, they actually operate like a utility itself. So they're dispensed. I don't know if you know how utility grids work, but the PJM interconnect controls all the power plants in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland service territory. And they tell pl power plants when to turn on and when to turn off based on their price to generate. All right, so as power prices go up, Reading Hospital will actually bring on units and generate to the grid. Um, that's okay. It's not our mission. I mean, we're healthcare, okay? We're not a utility. Um, and, and uh, you know, it can bring some, you could question the tax issues with that. Yeah, if you're a nonprofit mission, <laughs> all right, which healthcare is, and I'm generating power on the side to make money. Yeah, am I going to continue to be rolled a nonprofit? I'm not so sure. So I mean, it's a little risky from that standpoint, also. Okay. And again, when they do that, they're throwing away a bunch of the heats that are no better than the utility. You know, they're doing it strictly for the dollars. Remember what I said about triple bottom line: people, planet, profit. We're trying to influence all three. They're just looking at money. Okay, not, not to say that that's all bad, but I think, I think we do a little bit better. We have time for one more question. Who wants it? There it is. Oh, we got two. Oh, thank you. Um, I know that most of us are, are going to be going out into the world now and trying to <coughs> make a way for more energy efficient solutions and stuff like that. Um, the I community hope. college that I came from, uh, we had a cogeneration plant there as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just know that it takes a tremendous amount of space to do that uh, between your, your, your generators and your absorption chillers or your steam, tur or steam turbine chillers and stuff like that. Um, what would you say would be the, the best solution for energy efficiency for you know, buildings where space is an issue? Yeah. I mean, cloud generation isn't the first thing you do, okay? If you remember our cost for all the different alternative energy solutions, the megawatt was the lowest installed cost. So, I mean, it's really all looking at each building and what are my opportunities. I mean, every building is going to be different. It might have a 40-year-old boiler system that needs upgraded. It might, you know, need a new chiller plant because the chillers are 30 years old. It might, you know, it's hard to say. There's no, no one given set of, of solutions. I will tell you that cogeneration is something that takes a certain economy of scale. All right, so a large college, a large hospital, you can economically do that. Once you get smaller than, than the size we are, five megawatts, the price per megawatt goes up. So if I'm trying to do a two megawatt unit, 
That's much more expensive per megawatt than it is to do a five. So now it's harder to get the payback from it, all right? The economics change because I, I need a, a higher capital investment per unit of energy, all right? So like I said, I mean, there's no cookie cutter mold. I mean, it, but, but in every case, it's looking at what those efficiencies are in, in conversion technologies, you know, going from gas to heat, going from light to electric, going from electric to cooling, you know, and improving on those technologies, whether it's, you know, we talked in one class today about cooling towers, the effect that just merely improving a cooling tower can save 10 to 20% of your cooling cost. Yeah, so really digging into what those things are and where the opportunities are. So, and I, I disagree that Cogen takes a lot of space because I could fit my entire assembly up here on this stage mm -hmm. for five megawatts, including gas compressor and boiler, okay? If what we'd like to do now is to continue the conversation, but downstairs, and it can be more intimate because you can talk to Al in a, in a small group. So please join us now downstairs in the Rapture area for a reception, something to drink, something to eat, and we'd just like to say thank you again, Al. Thank you very much. Did you say rap?